Amen.
stand together. Tell somebody, Jesus Messiah, He's Lord of all. Jesus Messiah, He's Lord of all. Good morning, Waterbury Church family. I'm Pastor Brian. So glad you chose to be with us this morning, worshiping together. Uh, what a great day. A little bit of rain. The yard looks nice. Thank you, Mr. Cobb, our lawn service guy. You will do your house too. Just let them know on the side. Oh my goodness. What a great day. What a great day. Man, oh man, it's beautiful. Ties and offerings. There's a box on the back wall in the lobby. You can make a donation there or through the QR code and the bulletin or uh, on the church website. A couple different ways to give. And we're going to show you what giving does for our church as well in just a minute. We'll talk about that as well. Sunday School for All Ages on Sunday morning, 930. Join us uh, in the morning for that. Membership class today, today at 4 o'clock, is still time to sign up. I just need to know uh, head count so I can make sure I have enough uh, materials and snacks and everything. Uh, today at 4 o'clock, there's a sign-up sheet in the lobby or text me after church and say, hey, I'm coming, I want to be there, let me know. 4 o'clock today, if you take the class, doesn't mean you have to become a member, just get the information, learn about us, uh, what we do and why we do what we do, and uh, be a part of uh, what we're doing here at the church. Pick a ball on Monday night at 6 o'clock. Wednesday night activity, 6.30, uh, the, lower, the kids are in the lower level, youth group up there, Pastor Brad, and in the lighthouse, the class will do the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, plenty of time to jump in and be a part of that uh, on Wednesday night. National Day of Prayer, on Thursday, we're going to meet at the Oasis, which is a new park in uh, Waterbleak at noon. Uh, National Day of Prayer usually lasts about half hour, 45 minutes or so. Uh, if you have some time, join us for that. Uh, on Thursday at noon. Men's breakfast, next Saturday morning, 8 o'clock. I'm looking for volunteers. Uh, looking for volunteers to help out cook and stuff. Let me know if you're available. You can help us on Saturday at 8 o'clock for the men's breakfast. After the men's breakfast, if the ladies want to crash it, you're welcome to crash us and join us for breakfast and things like that. After men's breakfast, we're going to do some flower planting around the church. Some flower planting around. I have, we'll have some flowers and stuff, so bring a rake, shovel, and all that kind of stuff. Just do some yard work. Uh, we'll help Mr. Cobb so he don't have to plant flowers and mow at the same time. So join us for that. Everyone's invited to be a part of that. Uh, youth camp's coming right around the corner. Uh, sign up for youth camp. There's a sheet in the back. You can grab all the dates for that. Also, Somerset Beach Camp, part of what we own as a free Methodist church over by Somerset Beach, which is south of Jackson area. They have family camp that starts uh, July the 13th and runs to like the 20th. You can go and camp for a night or two or all week, and they have activities for kids and Bible studies and missionary information and great things going on throughout the day. Uh, you can be a part of that as well. And I think we handed out Mother's Day sheets. If you still have one, uh, get it to me so I can uh, get ready for what's coming up for Mother's Day uh, right around the corner. Next slide, please. Back in the day, in the 1800s, uh, the Waterbleak from Methodist Church started at the Waterbleak Bakery, which is about where Butternut Street is, that cuts down to the maintenance garage. There used to be a house there, it was called Water, Waterbleak Bakery. And that's where the Free Methodist Church started as a small group back in the 1800s. Okay? And from there, they moved down by the post office, and this is a, a picture of the old church on Pleasant Street next to the post office. And actually, the post office was the youth building for the Free Methodist Church back in 1950, somewhere in there. Okay? And I would, they told me that, but I found a newspaper clipping showing uh, what it looked like, and it looked like the post office. And uh, I, I kept thinking, well, they bought it and tore down the building and built the post office. No, that, the post office was the youth building back in 1950. In 1965, we moved to this location. Next slide. And in the backyard, between the parking lot and the backyard, they had an outdoor service for dedication of the land. And the circle guy, the little guy in the red hoodie, is uh, Wayne Quigley. Uh, we figured that out. We got this picture actually from Wayne. And so this was back in 1964-ish. And then next slide. And that's what the church looked like in 1965 when they built it. Next slide. And there's the inside uh, before they put the wood up. You can see the concrete black uh, backdrop and things like that. Next slide. That's what the house looked like in 1965 before the drywall got put in. And uh, next slide. 
This is the house that used to be next door, uh, Taylor's house. Next slide. It had asbestos, so they had to have hazmat suits to do that. Next slide. This is when they tore the house down. And we bought the, the, the land from basically from the driveway next door, right here, all the way over to the fence for about $8,000. And the county tore the house down for us on top of it, which was amazing. This is when we put the playground in. Next slide. And then we broke ground. Uh, 2021. Next slide. Oh wait, back one slide. Uh, this is an important piece to know. Uh, the big people in the slide are the people that were on the building committee and their kids, one of their kids. So we had the, the building committee and a child and then we had some former people that were here in 1965. Uh, you can see Tom and Ginger and Florence uh, were in the slide as well. Nancy Quigley was in that slide. They were here in 1965 when they built the building. Next slide. And then the footings, uh, next slide. Next slide, footings. This is a, a, the day they poured uh, the, the floor. Uh, the guy that uh, did the concrete testing had a drone, so he's got a drone shot for me. Next slide. Uh, roof going up, next slide. The roof was on in June, next slide. There's a nice shot from the roof. I don't know who took these pictures, they're blurry. Next slide. Uh, another drone shot that we got after it was done. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Uh, next slide. Uh, the gym, uh, when the gym floor was put in, before anybody walked on it. Uh, next slide. It all started with a dream. God provided the land next door, and we said, now what? Now what? And we came to you and said, hey, would you be willing to pledge to give above and beyond from 19, or eight, 2018 to 20? Um, and, we, and it was really a hard sell. I remember doing it and talking about it. I said, I have these pledge cards. Go home and pray about it. And that's all we talked about. That was it. We didn't say, hey, you got to give, you got to give, you better give. No. <coughs> Go home and pray about it. And then in two weeks, bring the cards back and we'll just toll them up. That simple. And uh, we didn't go around and beat people up or anything like that. We just, you and God, just pray about it. So <coughs> we started pledging money. And so we said, okay, there's enough people wanting and willing. So let's go forward. Next slide. And so we had these incredible drops. On, I should have had one. We had these drops on the wall. And we started out doing clusters of 50, 25, 25, clusters of 25. And then so they, each time a thousand dollars came in, we put another drop on the wall. By the time we were done, we had 315 drops on the wall. We had them there and there and there and there and there and there. And I think we almost ran out of space. It was amazing, crazy, awesome money that people donated from all different places. Even the people that we borrowed the money from donated, I think it was five thousand dollars. The credit, the credit union gave us five. As we were signing the paper, we'll, we're going to give you five thousand dollars. So they. they it was crazy. God provided just so many great, amazing places. And besides all of that, there was other people who said, hey, we're building a gym. We should have basketball hoops. I said, yeah, that'd be great, but we don't have money in the budget. And the family says, I'll, I'll pay for it. Okay. Someone else says, hey, you know what? That drywall should go all the way up to the top there. I'm like, we don't have money in the budget for that. And they, we'll cover it. I'm like, another man? Another family stepped up and says, what are you going to do with the floor? We don't have money in the budget. We'll cover it. Different families stepped up and above and beyond. It was amazing. I, there were so many times I just, I really, I cried when I heard the stories of people giving. Next slide. So there we have ribbon, ribbon cutting. Um, two years ago. Two years ago. Next slide. That's what it looks like today, as you know. Next slide. Open the surf. Yeah, that's next slide. Next slide. We gave everybody a bolt. If you weren't here, I have extra bolts. Uh, uh, they left a, a whole bucket full of bolts for me. So uh, buckets with purple ribbon on them, just for you. Uh, just to, to remind us that, uh, you know, we're to boldly go and tell people about Jesus. And the O was obedient, and the T was now's the time to do it. And just go and bolt people to Jesus. Uh, get them tight with Jesus. I think it was one of the sermon points that I made. Uh, so you're welcome to have a bowl uh, as we connect people with Jesus in our community. Next slide. Let's say our verse together. Around midnight, all in silence were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was 
shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. So, Pastor Brian, that $315,000, is that what we borrowed? Or that's what came in? Oh, no. I'm we sorry. We borrowed? I'm sorry. I, I should have finished that. I didn't have my note in front of me. So, here's the rest of the story. Um, we, uh, we collected uh, $315,000, uh, uh, we ended up, the co total cost of the building was about six fifty, dollars ballpark, give or take $1,000. Uh, but also all those other added things like the basketball on the floor and the walls and da, 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 and all the other things that were added, you know, that money came in on top of that money, that three hundred and fifteen, And so we ended up only borrowing $245.50. Uh, $245. That's all we had to borrow. So if you notice in the bulletin today, you see what the number is today that we owe on that two forty-five? Seventy-nine thousand dollars. There's the amazing thing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, so we have about uh, forty families in the church. If every family gave two thousand dollars, we'd have it paid off next week. Just, just, just a
stand for prayer. Jesus, that is our prayer. That you be the center. You be the focus of our lives. And we would give you praise and honor no matter what tomorrow brings. Because we know how much you love us today and how much you're going to love us tomorrow and how you're going to walk with us. And even in the midst of struggles and tragedies and surgeries and procedures and grief and all the things that we face in life, you are with us every step of the way. And your grace and your mercy is more than we can imagine. And you're working even when we don't see it. We, we know it. Father, I pray for Don as he uh, faces surgery tomorrow. Guide the doctors, give them wisdom, the nurses, all the people that will be a part of that, be with Ferdinand and the family as they wait uh, for information and surgery to be over with. And, and Father, we pray for healing in the days ahead as Don uh, recovers from his surgery, Father, that you would walk with him and 
Just encourage him. Let him know. Let him feel your presence, Father. Let him have peace in the midst of it. We thank you, Father, for what you're going to do and the witness, the testimony, the nurses, doctors, and people that they'll touch in the hospital over these next few days. Thank you for family being here. Father, we pray that you continue to bring healing to Barb uh, as she recovers from surgery and procedures. Father, just encourage her. Walk with her in such a way. We thank you, Father, for your love that you give to us every step of the way. Be with our missionaries as they share the good news of the gospel around the world. Protect them and give them boldness. Be with our men and women in the military as they serve so we can worship in freedom. We pray for our, our government, our president, and those people in charge making decisions. Father, that you would guide them, direct them. Father, we know that you are in control. And we trust you. We look forward to the return of Christ as we celebrate each day. But Father, we pray that today you just meet with us. That your word would speak to our hearts. That you would challenge us, Father. That we would have the boldness that Paul and Silas had. Help us to see that today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The children can be dismissed for junior church. A disciple of Jesus is a learner, learner learning to love like Jesus, walk like Jesus, live like Jesus, be like Jesus to others. Amen, amen, and amen. Uh, we're walking through the book of Acts. We're at Acts chapter 14. A couple weeks ago, we talked about how much Satan loves to stir up trouble as he stirred up trouble for Paul and Silas. And uh, Paul and Barnabas at that time, actually, uh, and then he ends up, they get beat up, and uh, man, oh man. And then we talked about what the world says and God's standard and how much there was difference between what the world says and the standard that God has set for our lives. And, and I challenge you to take a step towards holiness. Just an area of your life that God's working in, just say, I want to get closer to God in this area. Just take a step. And I hope and pray that you continue to take those steps towards God as we look to him. And last week in Acts chapter 15, we looked at, uh, we voted on painting the church purple. I'm glad that everyone agreed with me. We talked about disagreements and how you handle disagreements and uh, disagreements ha happen all the time in our lives and how you handle them and how you work through the conflict and, and the relationship in the midst of those disagreements are very important. And some of the ways I helped you understanding handling those, they need to be handled in love. Uh, disagreements handled in love, handled with truth. Uh, take your feelings and set them aside. And what's the truth? What are the facts, so to speak? Uh, always handle in prayer and handle with maturity. Handle those issues of life with maturity along the way. And remembering the relationship is uttermost important in that. And usually in a disagreement, God points out something that I can get better at. God says, oh, Pastor Brown, there's, here's an area. Yeah, you might be right, but here's an area that you can grow in. And, and sometimes I have that blind spot, but through a disagreement, God reveals to me, hey, I, I need to grow in this area. And so there's always God's examining my heart, my motive. And uh, these are times that God does uh, incredible things in our lives. Uh, disagreements and conflicts and those kind of things. And then we just talked about Matthew 18, how to handle if a brother in Christ sins against you, how to handle that. You go to them privately, talk to them, and work that out. And so we ended up at the Acts chapter 15, the very end of it, where uh, Paul and Barnabas have the disagreement because John Mark wants to go with him, and, and Paul says, no, he deserted us before, so he's not going to go this time, and so they split. And so twice as many people heard about the gospel, and uh, they took off. And so uh, we start in Acts chapter 16. Uh, Timothy is a new name that gets introduced in the book of Acts. And Timothy is the same guy that Paul writes to First and Second Timothy. Those are letters that Paul sent to Timothy. Uh, so Timothy, this, this is his introduction where he jumps in. And so he joins Paul and Silas and go on a missionary journey with them, led by the Holy Spirit. He has his vision uh, where to go and to be led. If you read Acts chapter 16, don't go here. He sends them to the region of Macedonia. And so they go to this region and uh, they arrive in the city of Philippi, which is the book of uh, 
Philippians that we learn about and see later on. So today we're going to talk about where is the best place to share the gospel. Where is the best place to share the gospel? Anybody got a good place to share the gospel at? Where you are. Where you are? Anybody else? Everywhere. Everywhere? Good answer. What? Bloom where you're planted. Bloom where you're planted. How many people share the gospel at work? At your home? With your neighbors? At school? In the bleachers? Nobody agreed with the bleachers. Hmm. At the ball field, where do you share the gospel? I love some of the answers. Yes. Share the gospel where you're at, where you're bloomed, where you're planted, those types of things, anywhere, everywhere. Great answers, great answers. So we're going to pick up with Paul and Silas. They're sharing the gospel. Surprise, surprise. Acts chapter 16. Uh, we're going to start at verse 13. On the Sabbath day, they went outside the city gates to the river, down by the river, uh, where they expected to find some place of prayer. Then we sat down and began to speak, and these women who gathered there, probably washing clothes or getting water or whatever the case may be, verse 14. One of them uh, listening was a woman from the city of Tyre named Lydia, a dealer in, in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart and responded to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to join her at her home. If you consider me to be a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us to go and stay with them. Lydia is a lady, a businesswoman. She's dealing in fine purple cloth. Uh, means that she's probably wealthy. Uh, also, purple was royalty or uh, riches, uh, nobility. Uh, it was expensive cloth. It was a sign. And so she was a businesswoman. And she opens her heart and responds. It's interesting, it says that she was a worshiper. So that says that she might have known a little bit about God, but God opened her eyes even farther. Oftentimes, uh, people know a little bit about God, but as they grow and as they mature and as they open up to God, God opens their eyes and their hearts to so much more. Uh, what's it say? Uh, if you draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. It's where God invites us. Yeah, we come to church and we worship, but is that it? No, there's so much more. And there's, here's where Lydia is at. She hears this and all of a sudden her eyes see and she begins to understand and it becomes exciting for her and she wants to be baptized and grow in her faith and just amazing things to do. And the first thing she does, she responds to the guys and say, come stay at my house. I open my door. Come stay with me. Come on. I got a place where you're coming. I, your visitors in town, come stay with me. So, so Paul and Silas share the gospel where they're at, down by the river in a small group. To share this gospel. Next stop, Acts chapter 16, verse 16. Once they uh, were in a place going to prayer, they met a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her own, owner by a fortune telling. Fortune telling. Verse 17. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. These men, they're pointing to Paul and Silas and Timothy. These guys, they, they're servants of the Most High God. These guys, they're servants of the Most High God, and they're telling you how to be saved. Verse 18, she kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, in the name of Jesus, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. That same power that Paul had, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, lives in us. The same power lives in us. This slave girl is going around and she's... Uh, she's telling the people that these men the demon within her is telling these men. And Paul had enough. It's, you notice it says many days. Many days. This wasn't just one day she was annoying them. So this, is, this is many days, over and over again. Many days. She kept this up for many days. First, many days it happens. 
And, it, and he says, in the name of Jesus, cast the spirit out. Sends the spirit. Verse 19. You, you, you would think that this would be a praise and worship service, break out. Every praise is to our God. Every praise, every form of worship is to our God. You would think this would be a praise and worship service. In the middle of the street, the servant girl just got slay, uh, saved. The evil spirit got gone. You would think they'd be jumping up and down. She'd be going, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free at last. You'd think, oh, just amazing, great stuff would happen right here. Look at verse 19. When her owner realized that their hope for making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the master and said, these men are Jews. Side note, just, you can see this right here. Uh, these men are Jews. You know, they were Roman citizens. See, they're falsely accused. If they knew that they were Roman citizens, they couldn't do what they were about to do next. So they're in the midst of doing ministry and they're falsely accused. These men, okay, so let's keep going. Uh, verse uh, 21, uh, by us. I'm sorry. Uh, the, these men, so they threw, threw up the city into an uproar and the custom is all unlawful for the Romans uh, to accept or these practices. Uh, Verse 22, the crowd joined in attacking Paul and Silas, and the magistrate ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. So they're stripped and beaten with rods because they cast a demon out of a servant girl. This young girl is being exploited because she has a demon in her. The master is using this evil spirit to interpret signs and tell people their fortune and, and tell future events. And this young girl is the money-making profit for this guy, for his own personal gain. The demon recognized that these men are men of God from the Most High. I always think it's amazing how the demons understand and see the power of God, but somehow we miss it. Somehow we miss that. They see the truth, and but we question the truth. So Paul commands the demon to come out of this girl, set her free from this. Uh, he doesn't allow the demon to say anything else because he doesn't want the demon to be the voice. He doesn't want the demon or her to be the voice inside of her telling where Jesus or anything about that. So the demon leaves her, and so there's a praise to the Lord. The girl set free. Uh, the demon's gone. She's set free of her pain and suffering. The truth has come out. The power of God is being displayed. Uh, great things happen. Amazing things happen. It should be all praise and wonderful and awesome. Have you ever been addicted to anything? You don't have to raise your hand. You don't need to do that. Just think with me for a minute. Um, maybe you've been addicted to alcohol or smoking or drinking or drugs or whatever, or pornography or uh, anger addiction. I mean, there's all kinds of addictions, right? And most of us have been addicted to something. I want you to know if you're addicted to something or something's got a hold of you that you just can't get over, maybe it's depression, I don't know. If you can't get over it, there's healing and there's power in the name of Jesus. True that. Right? And sometimes we read stories like this and say, oh, that happened in Bible's time. But the same God that did that works today. The Bible says that the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in us. Amen. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, man, oh man. There's power in the name of Jesus. Amen. Not by my authority, not by anybody else, but in the name of Jesus. There's power. And if you are caught in a trap, Satan's got you. You can be set free. I want you to hear that loud and clear. Loud and clear. It's very important. You can be set free. And if you're struggling with something today, today's the day to be set free. It's a great day. Today's the day to be set free. So Paul and Silas, 
in the name of Jesus, cast the demon out. So Paul and Silas just cost this master a boatload of money, right? Uh, his livelihood is gone. If, if we did that today, if, we, if that happened today, uh, we would hear things like, you violated the master's uh, uh, rights to exploit this girl. Uh, you, you took away his money. And so you'd get sued today if, if you did something like that. You'd get taken to court. You'd get taken out on social media or in the newspaper. You'd stir up the crowd, the mob. And they'd all be against you. The authorities would get involved and they'd be saying, I demand you my rights and all those kind of things. And so, so that's kind of what happened to Paul and Silas back in Acts chapter 16, verse 23. After they'd been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison. And the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received the orders, he put them in the inner cells, the inner side, and fastened their feet in stocks. Paul and Silas, preaching the gospel, heals a demon girl, gets beaten, flogged, and put in prison. Where's the best place to share the gospel? What did you say? Where, where did you say? Where you are, where you're planted, where you're blown. Where, any place? Paul and Silas. Down by the river, they're sharing the gospel. They've got a small group going. They're sharing the gospel. They're having a great time. Out on the street, they're sharing the gospel. Demon girl gets saved. Paul and Silas, where are they? Prison. Inner prison. Dark dungeon prison. Inner prison. Locked up. Verse uh, 16, uh, chapter 16, verse 25. I love this. About midnight, Paul and Silas were whining and crying and complaining and swearing and cussing at what was going on. Oh, wait, no, I read the wrong line. Uh, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying, <coughs> singing, singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening. About midnight. They're having an all night praise meeting. Him sing, whatever you want to say. They're singing songs. I wonder if they're singing, there's power in the name of Jesus. Wonder working. Wonder working power in the name of Jesus. My God saves, mighty to save. Jesus Messiah, I praise you, Lord. What's I don't know what song they were singing. Amazing Grace. I don't know if that was even that wasn't written then. They're singing, praise the name of Jesus. Praise Jesus. Praise Him. They're probably making up. I remember when I was a kid mowing the long ones. I made up a song. And I sang it as I was mowing. My neighbor came over. What were you talking about when you were mowing? I said, I was making up a song. They were singing praises to Jesus. Do you know what the difference between worship and worry is? Listen closely. This, is, this will save you a lot of pain and suffering. Worry is focused on the problem. Paul and Silas could have spent hours whining and crying. Worship is focused on Jesus. What do you focus on? What's your focus? What is it that you focus on? Worship and worry. It's really the difference is where our focus is. Do you have a song in your heart? <clears throat> a praise on your lips? Are you working on a memory verse? You got a memory verse, a verse running through your mind. So, man, oh man. Are you working on it? I almost got it down. Are you memorizing scripture? Are you filling your mind with this or that? What is it that you're focused on? I don't know about you or me, but, but if this was us, about midnight, we'd be having a pity party, right? Woe is me, I can't believe it, God, I'm doing your work, and you got me doing this, and I'm, uh, I got beat, I got straw on my back hurts, and I got chains on my feet. God, where are you? What did I do wrong? Right? That, that'd be us, right? Or we would even go as far as saying, God, this is your fault. If you didn't give us so much power to cast out demons, this wouldn't have happened to us. 
If we would have just calmly said, love Jesus, you're all good. No. No. Would there be doubt and questions and pain and worries? And we probably wouldn't be singing. No matter what tomorrow brings, I will praise the Lord. No matter what happens tomorrow, I'm going to praise you, Jesus. No matter if we wake up and there's a mouse or a rat or something chewing at my toes in the morning, I don't care. I love you, Jesus. Hmm. And then the but God moment. We talked about this on Wednesday night. But God shows up. But God shows up. Verse 26, suddenly there was a violent earthquake, and the foundation of the prisons were shaken. At once the prison doors flew open, and all the chains came loose. I don't think, it doesn't say this, but with my imagination as Pastor Brian, I, I don't think uh, Paul and Silas ever prayed, Lord, will you please cause an earthquake and shake this building up and don't let it fall on us, and in the meantime, during the, in the middle of the earthquake, somehow we just have the chains fall off our ankles. I don't think Paul and Silas prayed that prayer. Do you? I mean, come on. No, no way in the world. No way in the world. Maybe, maybe the, the prayer was, God, you got us here for a reason. God, you landed us in jail for some purpose. God, you got us to this place, to this time. Lord, reveal to me what you want us to do. But show me, God, how are you going to work out? What's going to happen to us tomorrow? What's going to happen next year? God, how are you going to let the gospel, your love, be seen with those around us? Lord, how are you going to show up during this time in this place? God, my ankles hurt. My back hurts from the beatings. My ankle, these chains are tight. God, I don't know why you got me here, but God, you got me here for something. I think that's probably what's going on, don't you? Verse 27, the jailer woke up and he saw that the prison doors are open and he draws his sword, he draws his sword to kill himself because he was in charge and if any prisoner escaped, he would have been executed on the spot by the authorities. So he's going to take his own life and be done with it. So Paul shouted out, don't harm yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for the lights. He rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He brought them out and asked, sir, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to get what you got? Is really what they're saying. What? I see it in you. I see it happening. What must I do? Because what you got, I want. Because yours is so much better than what I ever thought. What must I do? Then he replied, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. You and your household. Then they spoke the, the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. That hour of night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds and he immediately he and his household were baptized, so they have a baptism of about 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning. What a great time to have a baptism. The jailer brought them out of the house and set, set them a meal before them, and they were filled with joy. Can you hear him telling stories around the table? Come to believe in this whole house. Because of Paul and Silas's testimony, right? Because they're singing praises and worshiping God in prison. Because of their testimony, this whole house, the jailer, and so many others, we don't know how many other people that were in jail, how they responded to well, at this as well. Because of their singing, because they weren't whining and complaining, because they weren't swearing at the guys that put them in stocks or anything like that, because of that, because they saw and they heard the power of God, Are others seeing the power of God at work in your life? Verse 35, when, when daylight came, the magistrates sent the officers to the jail and ordered them to release the men in the jail and told Paul, the magistrate has ordered you and Silas to be released. Now you can go in peace. You're free. Get out of here. You're free. Just go ahead and take off. You're free. Verse 37, but Paul said to the officials, they beat us publicly without a trial. Even though we're Roman citizens, they threw us in prison, which was illegal for them to do because of the false witnesses. 
And now you want us to get rid of us quietly? No. Let them themselves come and escort us out. I see this as boldness of God. I see this in boldness of God. Verse 28, the official reported to the magistrate, and when they heard Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed, and they uh, came to appease them and apologize to them. So they go from beating them and arresting them to apologizing. Just hang on. If you're in the midst of a struggle, you're in the midst of... Just hang on. God's got this. God's got a plan and a purpose. They escorted them out of prison, requested them to leave the city. They, they begged them, the one translation says, they begged them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of prison, they went to Lydia's house where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. They told stories. Hey, we were singing and praising God, and all of a sudden everything started shaking and moving, and all of a sudden, and, and this is what happened. Amazing, amazing. And they stayed there for a while. Do you have the boldness of God to praise Him where you're at? Do you take those opportunities to share Jesus? If necessary, I always say use words, right? Uh, where's the best place to share the good news of Jesus? Small group on the street, where you're at, in prison, whatever it is. Others are watching your lives. And we are to be salt and light to the world. And when we are salty enough and Loving Jesus and do what Jesus calls them. other people are going to say, I want some of that. I don't know how you got through that issue of life. I don't know how you made it through this. I don't know how that happened. I don't know how you survived that. But whatever you got, I want some. I got to get some of that. People are watching. Do they see Jesus in you? Do you have the boldness to share Jesus with those people that you come in contact this week? This week. Let's bow our heads and let's just talk to the Father for a minute. If Satan has a hold of you, whether it's addiction or a demon or whatever it may be, I invite you to come and kneel and just say, Jesus, I need to be set free. Let us pray. Ask God to set you free from you. Whatever has got you. Addiction, whatever it may be. I invite you to just come and kneel. Let me pray for you. Pray with me today that God would give you the boldness to share Jesus wherever you are. Would you just say that prayer? Father, give me the boldness to share Jesus wherever I'm at. Father, give me the boldness to share Jesus wherever I'm at. Father, no matter what tomorrow brings, we'll praise the Lord. We'll praise the Lord. And Father, the story's not over. You have not finished the masterpiece that you began in our hearts and lives. And so, Father, whether we're down by the river or on the street or in prison, we're not giving up. We're not stopping. We're going to set our focus on you with a song in our heart a verse on our lips, a scripture in our mind, we're going to focus on you. So, Father, help us do that this week. Thank you, Father, for your love and your grace. Thank you for all that you provide in our lives. Give us your boldness this week. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thanks for being with us. Worship, come on. Uh, thanks for being with us and worshiping today. Uh, the worship team has one song to send us off with. Uh, God, he's in control. He's got it.